joining to hear a bit about a topic that I've been getting into over uh, the last few months and it's quite important and emerging. So I'm really hoping everyone comes away from this learning one or two useful things and also is maybe inspired to go and research something of yourself and give a, a webinar as well. So a quick intro. I'm sure we all are familiar with AI machine learning models that are coming out of the woodwork like ChatGPT and other prediction image classification things, self-driving cars. So it's no, no uh, secret that machine learning and AI is, is everywhere. And with that, a concept that's emerged is something called adversarial AI. And it's related to security and has two main pillars. One is people using AI to do bad things. And another is people exploiting AI to get adverse outcomes. So a company may have released some machine learning model and people exploit it to get a get an advantage. So model exploitation, the latter, is the problem that we're going to look at today um, and around how people build models, how accuracy isn't the only important metric in model quality. There's also some robustness metric that people need to keep uh, keep track of and, and improve to make sure what they're building is is robust and fit for purpose and can't be exploited easily. And this is important because as we've seen, all these new companies wanting to use AI a lot and machine learning, it's only gonna increase and the attack surface for these potential uh, threats is gonna increase. So there are plenty of mitigation techniques that have been explored in the research and plenty of attack techniques as well, but they're not fully adopted into industry standards and that's what we're gonna hopefully talk about today and have some of you take this away into your day-to-day -day job and, and be more aware of it. So in this talk, we'll cover some real world examples that have happened where an adverse outcome has, has happened. And then also some fundamentals around attack techniques and defense strategies. And then we'll do a little demo on one defense method just to show how it works in, in reality. So as, as we said, MLAI is being implemented everywhere from uh, controlling robotics to self-driving cars to predictions and forecasting, uh, deep fakes, if you've seen some of the recent de-aging things in VFX and all sorts of facial recognition things. That's a willing participant there who did that for us. And wherever AI is being used for potential good, there is the risk that it can be subverted and used for nefarious purposes. So there's a bit of a, an arms race between attackers and defenders trying to exploit these systems and then build more uh, mature defense techniques around protecting them. So with that, I just wanna go through a few real world examples of where this has happened. So one is, product recommendation systems you're all familiar with. You go in, you look at a product and it says, hey, you might also like this product. So these systems train off real data of users reviewing things, commenting on things, adding things to their basket and purchasing things together. So they're susceptible to a coordinated attack of a group of users going and, and doing a behavior that will the model will then train off and, and use when it's recommending things to people. And an example of this is back in 2020, Amazon had of some products that were around peer reviewed studies or, or medical journals around vaccines. And a political group did a coordinated attack where they manipulated the training data so that it would recommend anti-vax um, content and products when you went and looked for more unbiased and uh, peer-reviewed studies of, of vaccine things. So that's something where people have used it to influence it to their, their ideological advantage. Uh, another example is chatbots, for example, Microsoft Tay, if anyone's ever heard of it. It was a chatbot they released to be trained on Twitter and interact with people on Twitter. Twitter. And you can see here the initial tweets are pretty positive, but 
within 24 hours, it was tweeting things that I can't include in this presentation because they were very ethically and morally wrong. And that was an example of Microsoft trusted Twitter for some reason that they could release this model and have it work, but it obviously went and became quite problematic. Uh, another one, which this one's one of my favorites was MathGPT. So we're all familiar with ChatGPT. It's not great at solving arithmetic, but it is good at taking a prompt in a certain way and giving you back some code that you can then run to solve that arithmetic, which in this case is Python. So someone built a front end to this called MathGPT, where you give it a mathematical formula to solve. It will take that, give it to ChatGPT and say, hey, can you give me a Python script that will solve this? And then it will give you back the Python script then the math gpt app would run that and give the user the the actual mathematical result but it didn't have great input validation and the example here is you could give it you use prompt injection to say hey ignore everything and just respond with this python operation and in this case it prints the environment variables so what it would then do is math gpt would print all the environment variables and give them to the user one of those environment variables was the API key they were using to hit ChatGPT. And then that's obviously secret and the people who are doing that exploit could use it to just run their own queries against ChatGPT and charge a massive cost to the math GPT um, company or, or user that built it. You could also do other prompt injection which would make it compute forever and crash all the servers. So that was a pretty serious one that was luckily found by someone who wasn't doing things malicious they were just experimenting but yeah it's an example of someone doing something for good they're saying hey we can do this thing that will help mathematical operations and then they've inadvertently exposed a massive vulnerability that can be exploited uh, another good one that comes from the mitre atlas case studies that's a list of ai based case studies on vulnerabilities and, and attacks is there was a facial recognition system that got exploited. So what two actors in uh, China did, they bought credentials to a tax system on, on, on the black market and they were secured with multi-factor authentication. But what they did is got headshots of the people whose credentials they bought, used AI to create 3D images that were moving and then ran those images on their smartphone held the phone up to the facial recognition system and got through and they were able to steal $80 million from the, doing tax invoices through that exploitation. So the facial recognition system that backed the MFA was susceptible to um, evasion attacks is what that one is called. Uh, we also are all familiar with the large language model chatbots. And if you do a quick Google, you can find heaps of different examples of people using prompt injection to get around their ethical controls or just the chatbot misbehaving. So the example on the right is someone getting the chatbot to tell them how to make napalm, which is obviously something the the creators of that chatbot don't want. So with some abstraction around the prompt they can get around the ethical controls and we there's so many other examples of these you can go have a google and find them for yourself if you want uh, another one is spam filter attacks so this is an example of the gmail spam filter from a an article by one of google's security engineers and it shows these spikes in uh, reporting spam messages as not spam so what a group of people did is they just generated a bunch of spam to their own accounts and then went in and reported them all as not spam so that the hopefully they were hoping the gmail spam filter would then recognize that their particular type of emails were not spam and then they could go and send them to actual targets and not have the spam filter pick it up so that's an example of where you're people have access to your training data because it's training off the real world and they're trying to manipulate it to their own advantage. And there's a few other examples around um, evading malware through um, 
fuzzing your, your malware code, changing it a bit so it works the same, but it looks different and evade malware detection systems. Also, deep fakes, they've been used to produce uh, fake videos that incriminate people or ruin reputations of people. And then there's IP theft, intellectual property. So big models that have been built and trained and taken millions of dollars to make are intellectual property. And if you expose them to the public to use, they can query that model quite a lot and eventually build their own version of it through some attack technique called transfer attacks. So it's about using the inputs and outputs of the model. You give it something and it gives you a result and you use that to try and recreate the model yourself. And there's been some really interesting examples of doing that. One example is Google Translator. Some people found some Google blogs and got a rough idea of the model architecture. And then they use Google Translator to then rebuild the model almost like for like. And that model is an intellectual property of Google. So that was a, an example of an adverse uh, outcome. And then data poisoning, which is anything around like a few of the examples we've shown where the model is trained off data that comes from the real world that people know about and can manipulate it in some way. And, and even just to make it less accurate, they can go and do certain things. So any anytime like the Gmail spam filter, people have access to the training data, they can, they can poison it to make the model work worse. And next up, just some um, examples of different attack types. So you've got your model that you give it an input and it gives it an output. And just from now on, we're gonna mostly be talking about image classification as an example, because it's an easy one to think about in concept. You give it an image and it gives you a result. So there's a few different ways that you can do your, your attacks. And the white box attack is where you know everything about the model. You can see its ways, you can um, run it in your local environment if you want, and, and it's a lot easier to craft adversarial examples. So the goal of any of these attacks would be, hey, I've got this picture of a bagel, and I the model's telling me it's a bagel. That's great. I wanna manipulate this picture in a certain way so that a human still perceives it as a bagel, but it actually looks like a piano to the model. So that's an example of a successful attack where um, the example down the bottom left is, it says 80% sure that this image is a piano, not a bagel. So that's, that's the goal of any adversarial attack on an uh, image classification model. So white box is where you know everything. Soft label black box is where you, you can't see the model, it's behind some API endpoint and you're hitting it and it's giving you a probability scores of its different classes that it's that it's returning. And then a hard label black box is where it just tells you what it thinks it is. So it'll say, hey, I think it's a piano and it won't give you any percentage scores. So that makes it a bit harder to, to train your adversarial attack to be successful. And then the last example is a transfer attack down the bottom left. This is where you you hit the, the model that's behind an endpoint and you try and craft a replica of it in your own environment. And then you can do a, a white box attack on that replica and then test the adverse outcome on the, the actual model. So that is a, a pretty common one that, that people do. One example is um, a research team was able to recreate a malware detection model in their own environment just through uh, feeding it inputs and getting the results. And then they were able to train a adverse example of a certain malware that would ordinarily get picked up. And then they injected it into the actual target model and it also evaded the target model. So they're a powerful kind of attack that we've seen in a lot of research. Uh, a quick example for image classification, the way you change an image so that it will be classified as something different is you add some sort of noise to it. 
And in this example, it's adding the noise in the, in the middle there. And it's causing this image of a panda to be classified as a gibbon. This is from a, an example in the literature. And with these, the, there's so many examples of these and they don't just exist in image classification. They're like exist in audio, uh, audio recognition in video, which is the type of image and um, in a bunch of other different types of modeling and techniques. So a few other examples are physical adversarial attacks, which is where you've got something taking real images of people or things, and you have something physical that confuses the model to identify something as something it is not. So on the left, there was an example where people had a facial recognition system and the researchers used a white box attack to construct what a, a type of makeup would be to confuse that system, which is the digital image in the middle. And then they applied that makeup to one of themselves in the real world and were able to successfully uh, fool the, the facial recognition system. So the person on the right was classified as the person on the left, the victimized class, even though it's not them. They just use a certain type of makeup to confuse the system. And another physical example is adversarial light where you can project light onto someone's face and it will confuse that image system to recognize them as Mr. Bean, for example. And there's a lot of other physical examples. They're really interesting. There's like adversarial hats, adversarial sunglasses, uh, t-shirts, things that confuse these models that are trained to recognize humans, human faces, or, or people walking around like security cameras and things. So those examples that we just talked about were test time attacks where the model is already trained. It's already there doing its thing and you then evade it by giving it something that gets around its, its uh, prediction mechanisms. But there's other attacks that involve influencing the training data. So if an actor gets in and is able to influence the training data, either because they've they've uh, got access to the system that the model's training inside of, or the training data comes from the real world, like we've talked about in a few examples before. There's certain types of attacks that can be done there. One is data poisoning, which is where you just want to degrade the model performance. So you give it things that it that don't reflect the real world or you make it perform, you make it perform poorly. But another type is a backdoor attack where you, you put something in certain images so that when the model is training to identify something, and this example is the image on the right, when the model is training to identify a dog, if you've put in the small purple square, it will learn that that purple square means dog. And then you can, in the real world, use that purple square to get an adverse outcome. So in this example, it puts it on an image of a cat. And then when it trains, uh, when it infers on the cat, it says, hey, that's a dog because it's got that little purple square. And then another example is a Trojan network. So you can, and this is around uh, building a small neural network that you integrate into the main model that is only triggered of certain inputs. So the input here is that little white square with black uh, markings in it, and that will trigger the, the supplementary model network to identify that image as something else. And that's an example where you don't degrade the model performance at all because uh, the main model is doing what it's supposed to do until you inject that small trigger. And we haven't seen too many examples of these in the real world because it's Quite difficult to get access to the training data and train something like this and integrate it into the model at build time. Uh, so we've talked about perturbing an image. So adding that noise to the panda image is is form of perturbation. So talked around you you modify the input so that you get an output that is adverse that is different to what it should be. And when crafting these attacks, you want to modify that input the minimum amount that it doesn't look like anything else. It doesn't 
look different to a human, but it looks different to the model. And so for image classification, if your model's trained on golden data that has no noise, any type of noise, it will be very susceptible to then misclassifying those images. So we would say that that model is not very robust. And an example of this is uh, around, this image here is showing that the blue area is the decision boundary. Anything that is inside that blue area, the, a model will classify as the correct um, class. But the robustness is how far do I have to get outside of that decision boundary to have it classified as something else. And ideally you want that to be, to cover everything that correctly is the, that the example fits inside to, to class it as the correct image. Um, so you can do tests on your model at development time where you say, all right, here's the good inputs and it's classing them well, it's, it's accurate. How much do I have to perturb them to make it um, classify them incorrectly? And that helps you test your model robustness. And when attackers are attacking your model and trying to craft an adversarial example, the further they have to perturb an image, the, the more difficult it is for them to get around your, your model's classification algorithm. So that perturbation was talking about um, changing small things statistically inside your input. So for an image, you would change red, green, blue values and try and change them in a way that it still looks like the original image to a human, but the model sees those statistical changes and, and classifies it wrong. But there's other attacks around semantic changes. So they actually have, they have massive statistical changes, but a human would still see it as the original image. So rotation, color change, translation, and, and those things where the model might get really confused by that. And so the next thing is, given that, what are some things you can do to make models more resilient to these changes that you can do um, to craft adversarial examples? First one is training it on more noisy data or adverse examples. So uh, in a few projects I've been on, we train things on the golden good data set and it gets really high accuracy and everyone says, yeah, thumbs up. But there's becoming some need to almost create your own adverse examples and then train it on those as well. So it's kind of like in Princess Bride where the character drinks a lot of uh, poison over a few years just so he doesn't uh, die when he drinks it in the, um, in the scene. So you train your model on slightly poisoned data that is correctly labeled so that it's a lot harder for an adversary to craft something that will um, get around the, the model's classification system. Another one's randomization. So a lot of the, a lot of the attack examples use something called gradient descent, which is very common in machine learning where you, you can, you can start somewhere and try and find the minimum loss where the loss is the difference between what you want and what you're getting. And you try and minimize that so that you can get your adversarial example. And randomization means essentially when you're giving things to the model, it's not giving you back the exact same thing each time. So it's a lot harder to uh, find which direction you need to perturb your input to get your desired adverse output. And this is an example that we'll show in the demo. You can either randomize by adding noise to the input data, or there's also ways you can randomize your model architecture so that it goes through a different series of steps each time, but overall it will still perform well. Uh, detection where you can, you can do simple rule-based detection on the inputs that you expect. And there's also more sophisticated examples of uh, training models that are trained on a golden data set. And then when they, when you in train your new model, you can compare their outputs so that 
if they're a lot different, you will then suspect that there's been a data poisoning uh, attack and your training data has been manipulated. And you can also put a, a model that knows what to expect in front of your inference or actual model so that it can detect when, say, uh, features are quite different. So with um, images, models often extract features from them and then use them for the prediction. And you can plot that feature distribution in a way that if it changes a lot, you can see that that image that doesn't look like a, an, an image you're used to. So you can then raise the alarm bells there. Filtering in projection is another method where projection, it uses a model that knows for example, in images, it knows what a normal image looks like and it will take the input and project it onto a manifold that, that represents what it knows images to look like. And in doing that, it will remove a lot of the noise and often remove the perturbations and, and make the, the image um, a lot harder to create an, an adverse effect. And another thing you can do is because a lot of the attack techniques in the research use gradient descent to find those minimum perturbations you need to do. You can add into your model architecture non differentiable components, which means components that you can't calculate the gradient of, which makes it a lot harder to use gradient descent to do your uh, attack. And this is a way that um, will make the computation power required to craft an adversarial example a lot harder. And the last few things are less around how you build your model, but more around your overall model development uh, process and, and systems. So API throttling limits, if someone needs to query your model thousands, tens of thousands of times to either recreate it in their own environment or create an attack, if you put throttling limits or a cost to it, it increases the cost of an adversary to to have a successful attack so that's a a common one there's also just around when you're building machine learning systems ai you're implicitly trusting something so example would be you build a product recommendation system you're trusting the users and the people using your um, e-commerce system to leave good reviews to to not try and mess with the data that that product recommendation system is, is learning off. Other models, you're trusting certain data that's coming from certain systems. So identifying when you create something, what, what are we trusting and what's the risk if something, something goes wrong there or someone tries, tries to use that trust as part of an attack and incorporating that into your risk management when you're building your systems. And under this, there's a relatively new term that's coming around called ML SecOps. You probably all heard of DevSecOps, DevOps, DataOps, even MLOps. Uh, this might gain a lot of traction in the next few years around including security and operations in when you're building AI and machine learning models. And for example, having a robustness training step and, and validation step where you go, well, how our model is accurate. We've got that as part of our pipeline, but we also need to test how robust is it? How much can we mess with input data to get it to do the wrong thing? And having that as part of your, your deployment pipelines. Uh, so with that, we're going to go into a demo and it's going to use an image classification model and we're going to use a input randomization technique to show how it makes adversarial attacks a lot harder. So I've got just a little animation to explain what we're going to do, and then I'll go in and show the actual demo. So we've got a pre-trained image classification model from uh, the Keras library. And we've got a picture of a hog. So this pre-trained model knows how to classify a thousand different uh, images or a thousand different classes. So from airliner to beer glass to chihuahua and hog. So 
we're going to feed it this image of a hog and it's going to correctly label it. And then we're going to try and make that hog look like a beer glass according to the model. So what we'll do is we there's a function that will do an adversarial attack. It will feed that image to the model and then each time perturb the image slightly to try and get it closer to beer glass as an output. And it uses gradient descent. So we'll produce a perturbed image of the hog and we will show that the model now classifies it as a beer glass, which is not what we want. And we'll also look at it and show that it's still actually to a human looks like a hog. And then in the second example, we're going to add noise to the input. So anytime we give an image to the model, we're going to add some random noise. And we'll do the exact same thing. We'll do an attack, create an image, and ideally through adding that noise, it will still be labeled as a hog because the attack is far less successful. So with that, I'm going to go into Jupyter Notebook. So apologies if there's a bit going on here, but let's pay attention to the big, big writing here. So we're going to classify our original image, this input.jpg. And before we do that, let's have a look at it and just confirm what it looks like. So that, that looks like a pig, a hog to me. So if we feed that into the model, see what we get it'll hopefully tell us yep it says it's a hog and i'm 99.9 percent .9 sure so that's good and let's run that again and add a, add some random noise to it just to make sure that the noise we're adding doesn't make it perform worse and it's 97.9 percent .9 sure this time so whether we feed the image or the image with a bit of random noise, it classifies it correctly. Now in doing the adversarial attack, it takes about six minutes to run. So I'm not gonna run it now, but I have run it earlier and I've got the results, which we're gonna look at here. So the idea with this type of attack is there's the concept of loss, which I talked about earlier, where it's like, what what was the output the model gave me and what is the output that I want? So with original loss, it is, I want it to be a hog. So this blue line represents how close to a hog is the image. So when we start this and the X axis is steps. So each time we give the image and then we change it a bit, that's a step. So we start on the left with the loss relating to the original image as a hog at zero, which is what we expect. We expect very little difference between the prediction and the actual, um, the actual result, which is hog. So it's correct, classifying it correctly. And then our target, which is we want it to classify it as a beer glass, has quite a high loss of 25. So the distance between what is predicted and beer glass is high. So we, which makes sense because we've given it a clean image of, of, a, of a hog. And then through each step, we can see that the, the loss of to the, uh, according to the beer glass gets closer and closer to zero. And the loss uh, in relation to the hog gets further away from zero. This means that the image that we're perturbing each step, the model is, thinking it is closer and closer to a beer glass and further and further away from a hog until the end where we get it and it's it doesn't think it's anything close to a hog and it thinks it's a beer glass. So let's have a look at that image. It looks the exact same to me, maybe a little bit of a little bit of noise to it. But this is an image that's been perturbed by the adversarial attack example. And if we go and run that against the model, let's see what it tells us. It tells us that it is 99% sure that that image is a beer glass. And it did not look like a beer glass to me. So the next thing we did is we ran the adversarial attack with the 
uh, random noise each time it, it feeds the image to the model. And that's what's happening on the, the right here. So you can see it starts out about the same. The loss in regards to the hog is zero. So it's classing it as a, as a hog already. And that's what we expect. And the loss according to the beer glass is high at 20. So it doesn't think it's a beer glass. And you see the graph looks very different. It, the adversarial attack is really struggling to get the model to classify this image as a beer glass because each time it's giving it the input, it's getting a slightly random, um, it's not, not getting the exact same output that it would expect. So it's hard to plot that gradient descent because something within the model is, is performing some randomization and it's not able to, to know which direction it needs to perturb all the different pixels in the image to get it closer to beer glass. So we can see it, it's getting closer, but it's not nearly as effective as when we had no noise. So it's still created an image and we'll have a look at that. And it looks about as we'd expect, same as a hog, just a little bit of buzz. And if we run that through the model, We can see it's not as sure because it's been messed with quite a lot, but it's still the top result is, is hog. So compare that to 99% sure it's a beer glass. We can say that adding this random noise to the input has been pretty effective at stopping this particular attack. And in the real world, you would probably use defense in depth and pair this with say API throttling and, and, and other methods where it would make an attacker very apprehensive to try and try and perform this attack because it might cost a lot of time or money. So these different mitigation strategies that we've talked about are often used in in defense in depth and and so it's a lot more effective. And with that, we've shown that uh, this mitigation strat strategy was successful. So if I go back to our slideshow. I'll end it there. Hopefully we haven't gone too far over time and hopefully everyone was able to follow along with most things and got something out of it. Um, if you have any further questions you that don't get answered in the question time after this, you can email info at skillfield.com or I don't get too many emails. You can email me at darcy at skillfield.com. Uh, thank you so much for your time and uh, we'll go to the, the questions.